Scott Winterode is probably one of the most prolific painters that I know, personally at least. He's an amazing watercolorist. He's been doing this for a long, a long, long time. And he also has been working in museums um, for several decades and is just extremely knowledgeable about art and art history on all kinds of levels. And he's also someone that I feel lucky enough to call one of my best friends. And I've known him since uh, the 90s when we were both in art school together. And um, you're gonna see in this talk that we're very comfortable with each other and a little bit silly, which is nice because we actually talk about some kind of heavy things and I, I wanna make sure that I give everyone a heads up about that because um, especially uh, there's a section where we're talking about wildfires and I know that that is something that unfortunately a lot of people are um, affected by personally um, in very substantial ways and um, so just depending on where you are with that I just want to I just want to let everybody know that that's there otherwise we have some really great conversation around atomic bombs in Scott's artwork and the movie Oppenheimer and then even getting into like Georgia O'Keeffe and where was she during all of the the uh, Trinity tests and and you know that period of history when she was in New Mexico and um, Scott has a very unique perspective on that. At the end of this it's going to cut off a little bit abruptly because we talked for a very long time. I decided to cut it in two so there's a, a bonus video that I'm going to introduce at the end of this so don't run off right as Scott and I finish talking. Hi Scott um, Winterode. Hello how are you Lisa? <laughs> You have Daisy with you today. Daisy. She's here. She likes to be right here. Yeah. She's just... she's the newest member of the household in the last just year. She's still under a year here. And yeah. she's probably like two years old. Yeah. And just the um the ruling of Queen Newbie, who's the the matriarch. She is tolerating. Daisy, and uh, she's doing pretty good. She had a bad night last night. She had some problem with her right front leg and uh, had to go on some pain meds for a while and uh, seems to be doing better. I can see her from right here. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad she's tolerating the young and <laughs> All right, so I had, I had a specific... Um, a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about. And, and one is just the timeliness of your uh, series of paintings that feature mushroom clouds from some of the different atomic bomb sites mm -hmm. and uh, the movie Oppenheimer. And of course the anniversary that we just had in August of the, the two actual bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, let's can let's start with like talking about what you know your your motivations and interest in painting those clouds over the years because this is something that's actually spanned quite a lot of years for you right yes um actually I'm glad we had this pause and this restart because it kind of takes me back to 1997 and when we went you and I and a group of friends went to visit the um, actual site of the Trinity Jess. Am yeah. I, I'm 97, right? Because that's, no, that's not right. No, it was 95. It was 95. I'm so sorry. It was a long time ago. It was in the 90s. And um, oh, wait, it, was, it was 97 because we went on the 40, it was the 47th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was the anniversary. It was the anniversary of Roswell, not the anniversary of the bomb test. Yeah. But we went to Trinity site right. at that time. Yes. So, I mean, I had always been... The actual Trinity test was in 45, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. July 16th, 45, right? 15th, 16th? I'm so sorry. Anyway, um, but the point being, we went to the test site. I had always been fascinated in nuclear history and really the genesis of all of my interest in 
the bomb and, and painting the bomb and everything came from my father who was um, uh, worked in uh, aeronautics and worked in the defense industry for years and built planes. And he used to work at, at General Dynamics, later Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth. And it was a it was a site that was designated as a, 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 a blast site if nuclear war ever went out. So he would always tell us that if if a bomb was headed this way, he was just going to go out on the tarmac and wait for it to hit because it was ground zero for it. No duck and cover. No duck and cover. No putting and, X X shaped tech, uh, tape on the window. <laughs> no. And I was like, I was like ten, and I was like, really? That's that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As he would, I mean, like the day after it came out, and that super freaked me out. And like, there were just so many things in our childhood that were about the fact that the world was about to end and it was all going to be nuclear war. Yeah. Uh, it just freaked me out completely. And it just stuck with me so much. And so I was so fascinated to learn more about nuclear history. And I, I was reading about it. We went to the site. Um, I finally visited in, it was in 2017 that I finally visited and looked over the uh, Nevada test site. I've not taken a tour or anything. You can. So, I mean, I just always have been really fascinated with, with this idea of nuclear testing in the middle of our country, yeah. which is devastating and its effects probably on people and cancer and other things like that. But but that we did it for so long and so sustained and nobody really questioned it. And we just kind of went along about it because it, it maintained the, the United States as a superpower for so long. Bombs, though, as a paint, as painting the bombs, I had, I had, because, because of the collection of the postcards, which I, I jokingly told you whenever I started this whole thing that I'm holding my phone in a postcard rack right now to do this zoom. Um, uh, I collected postcards for years, and so I've always been interested in postcards. And um, I've always been uh, interested in this idea of places and the things that are associated with places and places that are really close to me, like New Mexico, California, other things like that. And so I had I had long thought about doing a, a large letter postcard of California, or sorry, of New Mexico, and putting a bomb test in that. And there's a sketch from way longer before I started painting the bombs where I conceived that idea. And then um, uh, a good friend of mine was doing a, she was doing an art show related to a play. It, it was about nuclear war and love and this kind of love story under nuclear war. And so she asked me, she was like, well, you've always talked about painting these bombs. So maybe you should paint me some nuclear bombs. And so I started painting these really large uh, 40 by 50 inch uh, paintings of nuclear bombs. And that's kind of what started the process. And at the same time, I painted small postcard size paintings of nuclear bombs. And I, I exhibited them in a postcard rack. And so that's kind of the genesis. And then they kind of took off from there. And you also made actual postcards. Yes. Which I have one of. When was that? When was all that happening? 2009 to yeah. 2012, probably the strongest. I feel like you very diligently every year post and honor, you know, the the anniversaries of the two actual bombings in Japan. Um, how, like... Mm -hmm. What is that? What is what is the? I'm trying to figure out how do I want to articulate this question. Um, I mean, it's it's very heavy and intense subject matter, and I'm just curious about like the experience of painting for you while you're painting it. What does that feel like for you um, to be kind of in that sort of realm of of heavy? Uh, subject. I'm always interested in the the balance between the beauty of the bomb and the the mushroom cloud explosion, and then the the ramifications of what that really means. And actually, I'm really glad you said what you said about the interest in the commemoration. And 
it's just kind of like weird things have happened over the years and I, I can't name them all, but just recently my sister said to me, she goes, oh, I, I remember in 2007, we were in Washington, D.C., and we wound up at Ud Barhazi. So I was with my sister, my parents, and my niece, and I met them up to go to a museum meeting, because I'm a museum person, and uh, I was going to a meeting in D.C., and we met up in Virginia and went to Ud Barhazi. Basically, really, our point of the visit was to see a plane my father had worked on and had, you know, my father blew up planes to figure out you know what were the what was the best way to mitigate problems if something catastrophic happened to the plane and to the for specifically the pilot um so he was a operation operations analysis uh, for uh, aviation for general dynamics and he was quite a specialist in his field like one of very few people that did that so he would blow things up in order to know what was going to happen and so we went to see a test plane that never got blown up he was supposed to blow it up but it never happened and it's at barhazi but we happened to be there on um i guess it was august 9th um, and i'm gonna here i am this is why i should have read up what i'm talking about it was the day the enola gay had dropped the bomb on i want to say the enola gay dropped the bomb on nagasaki and i'm probably blending these two things completely um but anyway, we were there and it was just very weird and it just felt very personal again, like mm -hmm. to know the plane was the cause of such destruction and death. Um, and for reasons I think that were justifiable at the times and at the same time, you know, we have questions today about the justice of all of that. And I'm sure, you know, many people have questions about the justice of all of that. Um, but yeah, so it's it's very problematic. It's kind of why I've shied away of never depicting the events of August 6th and August 9th um, and just depicting the bomb test, just to make sure we remember that despite the fact that we use these things against humans twice, um, we've used these things against humans many, 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 many times. There was a, a New York Times article just a few weeks ago that talked about the weather patterns and how the distribution of the Trinity test and then later, of course, the uh, distribution of the 30-something other tests that occurred in Nevada um, and how weather patterns carried those, mm -hmm. the around the United States. So, right. and, and again, the weather patterns and the way that they showed up on the map, they look like watercolors, like somebody had dropped these purple, <laughs> violet hues in the midst of yellows and ochres and other things and let them just run on their own. I mean, they were absolutely beautiful and then absolutely devastating at the same right. time. So there's this this weird back and forth of destruction and beauty that I think always, unfortunately, I hate to be this way, go hand in hand. It sounds wrong. Yeah, but it's well, right. I mean, that's what's going on up here where it's hard to me. There we go. Like with these Hawaii, I don't like, I don't want to detour. Yeah. To that, uh, but just acknowledging that, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I'm working with similar themes as well. But last summer, I was painting these crazy, horrific fires in northern New Mexico. Yeah. And I posted one of them and somebody living up there was like, it's not beautiful. It's, it's yeah. terrifying. And yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, but it is about this it is about a very 19th century idea of awe of the overwhelming power of nature. Yeah. And, you know, that's something in my, my work in museums, it's very rooted. And so, you know, to have this kind of sublime moment of yeah, something that's totally overwhelming and you can't even comprehend. I was about to that's... use that, that word, the sublime. Yeah. I, I I mean I know you and I have talked a bit about that a little bit over the years, but just um, you know that's that's a um, I mean in in art history specifically that that word is referring to like the the experience of of awe and like 
you know, seeing and, and being immersed in an environment that is so much larger than you, but there has to be this like edge to it. You know, there's a, there's like a danger knowing that this wildness could kill you, you know, if you're not lucky or careful. Or just something incomprehensible. Right, exactly. Right. I mean, I, I was in Glacier National Park two weeks ago, and I just couldn't even get my head wrapped around the distances I was looking at. And yeah. and you you just can't you can't figure that out. I was you know I was at I was at uh, Muir Woods three days ago, and and you just you just get into this kind of idea of this is so overwhelmingly amazing, beautiful, but it's also just beyond me. And in terms of time and scale and space it just it, it's kind of incomprehensible and you just get a little overwhelmed by the whole thing yeah yeah well I want to come back to the wildfire paintings later that was on my list of things to to talk about with you but um let me ask you your your thoughts about the movie Oppenheimer I was really surprised because the previews made me think it was going to be a little bit overdone and just kind of silly. And, you know, because all the, the kind of catchphrases were like, you know, you know, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened. And I was like, really? Is that how it's going to feel? But I think it was very artfully done. I was very pleased with the film overall. I thought it was it was really quite fantastic and and very faithful. And the, the one thing about it, when I read the reviews initially and talked about the the back and forth of the timeline, I was uh, I was a little dismayed. Like, oh, this sounds you know very confusing. But it, it's just it's very very incredibly well done and like I said, artfully done. I yeah. think there's a lot of a lot of moments where the director's trying to take us into a moment of of the thoughts of Oppenheimer melded with this idea of the atoms exploding and so there, there's a beauty to it that I thought was quite quite well achieved so i had a different experience um in that yes it was very artful and consciously put together but i didn't necessarily feel uh that it held and that it was successful mm -hmm. in um in conveying the sense of urgency around this particular topic that still is very applicable um that i mean that was part i mean there's there's a lot of layers to to my reaction to that film and in a way i mean i i really appreciate that i, I like when i walk out of a movie and almost a month later i'm still chewing on it i mean that yeah. that's a really positive thing i think so I acknowledge that for sure. And I also have to acknowledge that um, in some ways, like I feel like I should have been a sure thing in terms of of the audience that, that would have been responsive to this. You know, like you said, you and I have been to the Trinity site and mm -hmm. um I have a different kind of interest in it, but I, I, I also have an interest in, in that, uh, topic and all of those events. Um, but I just am just kind of over the whole political intrigue genre. Um, and there yes. was so much of that, like, the, especially the last hour was, that's what it was. And, I, I just um I think I, also I can't I can't like the whole Barbieheimer thing, you know, <laughs> I can't separate those. And I think that's okay because I think they they work off of each other in really fascinating ways. And I saw Barbie beforehand, not the same day, but the day before. Wow. <laughs> and I, I had like a similar response that many people are having and, you know, women are having of just like finally feeling seen and heard and, you know, like it felt very 
future focused and um and this was something that was literally looking backwards and while you know i appreciate that there were characters in there that um you know in the past would not have been given any like screen time at all but um i mean specifically some of the the female characters um and just historically it's kind of hard to to not have that story just be a whole bunch of white men in suits but that's what it was and it was i saw it at the imax and they were extremely large in my face and it and this whole uh topic of patriarchy that barbie had just brought up to the forefront and then watching that movie uh whether or not it was a critique on that it still was it wasn't detached enough from it that i just i had a very visceral response to it you know just like i'm tired of this like i'm tired of it i kind of wonder if Part of that, though, is that, that that this movie was not based really. I mean, it, it was supposed to be based off a bio of Oppenheimer, and so him. Right. So, um, the other thing is, is that that whole thing of him being uh, uh, stripped of his position basically was. I mean, they they made it. I mean, and I haven't really looked into it as much, and I've I've read a lot about this in the past, but I haven't read about it lately. But I mean, I've read a lot about them wanting to take his security clearance away. I, so I, I feel like it's it's so focused on him because it's really a biopic. Oh, so yeah, absolutely. But, but like you said, I mean, it's correct in some ways. I was really but impressed. It, that's a life. choice, you know, that's a choice to yeah. tell the story in that way. Yeah. Um, and, and, he, and he's a complex, Oppenheimer was a complex person who yeah. you know had an enormous impact on the world um and and it is a story that deserves to be told um but i i, I just felt um i just i could i just couldn't connect in a lot of ways and i think it's just it's it's me and it's where i am with that whole sort of energy of it but I, I it's also not just me because I've had a similar conversation with a lot of people um it fell a certain way at a certain point yeah I I, I understand what you're saying I mean I, I I mentioned this before but I'll say it here again that funny to me in the movie was that you know like I, I've read very often because of my interest in American modernism painting that um the people that worked at Ghost Ranch in the 1930s and 40s had to have very high security clearance because the people at Los Alamos would recreate there. And so like George O'Keefe was checked out, you know, with high, high level security to make sure she was okay for them to be around. And that was not known for many, many years. But the funniest thing about the movie to me was that they used Ghost Ranch as Los Alamos. And so yeah. like every background shot was O'Keefe. So whether or not you know, women had a strong role in this movie or not, O'Keefe's Mountain is yeah, in the that's back a good point. of I, every I know, shot. Like, <laughs> when the, the first time they showed it, I started laughing. And uh, and my daughter was with me sitting next to me and she kind of looked at me and I kind of like gestured, like, I'll tell you later. And, um, and then I totally forgot about it, you know, cause it was like an hour and a half later when the movie ended, but, and so many other things had happened, but, um, I, yeah, I understand like there's, there's reasons why certain locations are, are chosen and there's a full on town at, uh, Los Alamos now. So I haven't been there in probably like 20 years, but, um, I don't know what the sprawl issue is and what the you know not far to go on a mesa top yeah so <laughs> i also wondered if maybe they specifically chose to use that as a backdrop because it has a very new mexico iconic feel you know like maybe. whether or not people recognize it as being associated with georgia o'keefe um it, it, it took me out of the zeitgeist. 
thought. I was just like, okay, that's that's not where we're at. You know what I mean? And it's so funny because a, a person who myself who's lived in LA for almost five years, I I realized just how things are used, and so it was just funny to me in the film that they use that over and over again, and they use the Biltmore in downtown LA as the setting for almost every. I don't even know how to describe it because it was like Washington DC at the end, but in the beginning it was something else. And it was just like, and it was always the Biltmore and you're like, Oh, but that's just the Biltmore. And if you've right. ever been to Biltmore, you know, that's the Biltmore. So it's yeah. just the way LA works. And I, I get it. It's, it's in just, every, it's in everything. Yeah. So, you know, every. yeah. Um, so uh, let's go back to Georgia. Um, I didn't realize that she had had to have her, her security clearance checked out um and like if i she she was there already was she living there full time do you know if she was in abiqueue full time at that point she didn't oh god no see this is why i'm like i should have read up <laughs> no it's fine um i mean she started staying at ghost ranch i want to say Oh, I can't remember anything. I think it was earlier in the 1930s. She was renting a house. And later she was allowed to buy the house she was renting. Uh -huh. So that was her really first kind of place. Although I don't think she bought it till later. And I want to say she didn't buy the Abiquiu house until the mid-1940s. I, I feel like the number is 46. But Stieglitz died in 47, so that seems kind of late to me. Um, but that could be correct. The reason she wanted the Abiquiu house is because it had a garden associated with it, as opposed to the Ghost Ranch house, which you couldn't really garden there. Um, there just wasn't, I think, arable land and uh -huh. you know, just a place where she could have functioned. Yeah. And Ghost Ranch, she was really dependent on the, um, the dude ranch that was there already. Um, uh -huh. And it's like maybe like 250 miles or something north of where the Trinity site is, right? It's, it's, it's a, oh, yeah. I'm remembering it's a good drive. Um, yeah, yeah. So it the probably movie... wouldn't have been visible from there. No, 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 no. Uh, the movie makes no differentiation really and doesn't really clarify it in any way. And also the test. Los Alamos. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The, t the test took place during the day. That was one of my little nitpicky things of like, the, you know, it had this very um, dramatic backdrop of the the night black. Well, night it was night. probably pre-dawn. That's correct. I, I don't think so. I mean, I remember looking at the, well, we'll if somebody knows, they can put it in the comments, but I'm going to also look it up later because I really feel like I, from looking at the photos and when we were there, when we visited, they have well, photos on the fence of so, the yeah, those are, those are the Edgerton photos. So, um, oh God, I'm going to blank on his first name too, but the photographer Edgerton is the one that was doing the stop motion, or I don't know what I'm even trying to say. Stop motion is not the word, but he was in sequential photography to capture all of those second by second images. And so um, Edgerton captured those images and that's why there's there is really a black background on all those images it's it was just pre-dawn i i think that's correct okay but we're gonna yeah. look it up <laughs> yeah Along with they, the, we're gonna fact check they, they play with it a lot and that, the, that was an interesting aspect of it i i kind of bought it i guess i bought it into the whole thing i was just kind of like i expected okay. i expected very little from the movie <laughs> yeah and see and i went in i like, went oh, in the this... other way around like i was you know before i knew that greta gerwig was the director of barbie i was just like i'm not gonna go see a barbie movie you know and then and i love all her other work so i realized it was not just gonna be like a fluffy kid movie but um i've been looking forward to oppenheimer since i first heard yeah. they were doing it so um you know maybe it's it's always that thing of of your expectations um, i got so turned off on previews of oppenheimer i was just kind of like eh, really yeah. and then i came back up with the whole imax thing so i was like well i guess i should do this and you know i mean it's just such a thing that's been part of my 
my interest in life. So I'm, I haven't seen Barbie yet. I, I feel terrible because um, okay. I know, you know that, yeah, I, I will go see it. But yeah, it was, the Barbenheimer thing was so bizarre. Yeah, but I <laughs> love that kind of bizarre stuff. I mean, I, yeah. as soon as they started putting those memes out there, I was just like, this is this is what it's all about, you know? So let's go back to, to Georgia really quickly because um, while we were watching the movie and I saw the mountain and everything and she came to mind, I was wondering in her, I mean, because there's just like this vast treasure trove of all of her correspondences with various people. And yet I've never heard anything about her perspective on any of that kind of stuff and if she was um you know in a position where uh she had this had to have like a security check on her done then maybe she was being a little closed-lipped on purpose I don't know but do you know for people who don't know, Scott is like a actually incredibly knowledgeable about Georgia O'Keeffe and all her various locations where she painted in her life, and along with tons of other things he's knowledgeable about. But do you know if um, you know there was ever any kind of uh, mention of it from her or a political uh, position that she took? Um, so funny that I have this giant book of letters that was recently published right behind me. It's that kind of red book in the far right corner. And I haven't really delved into that because I've been looking at other crazy things that I found in these books. Um, I, um, and I have other interests and I'm, I've been thinking about with that particular book and, and O'Keefe and her interest in her mountain, her paternal, uh, mountain, paternal, and, um, and the associations she had with uh, Paul Cezanne and his mountain, uh, Mount St. Victoire. But I haven't really looked to see if there's any reference. So let me look and maybe we can make a post if, if there's something that I find. Because um, the letters are probably the most comprehensive things that have been published so far. And those were closed for many years after her death, but were published in 2013, I think it is. Yeah. And uh, prior to that, so the thing I can say is that O'Keefe was incredibly, O'Keefe and her uh, husband, Alfred Stieglitz, were incredibly pacifist uh, in their views on war. And so I cannot imagine she would have been, uh, I mean, of course, she would have had no idea what they were actually doing out right. in New Mexico. And uh, if she did, you know, and I think I've talked about this in different ways over time. I was like, you know, like, I mean, she would have been there in, in July of 20 of 1945. She would have been up in northern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So she would have been afraid of all the, yeah. <laughs> the fallout that went straight north and then yeah. passed over the, the northeast of the United States and over um, uh, Utah and Colorado and that area. So I mean, she was she was there and she was definitely affected by it. And I think if she had known really what was happening, she'd be mortified. I, I just, I can't imagine any other response from her. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, yeah. she, you know, from everything I know about her was a woman who um, was very firm in her convictions and did not, she was not a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, anti-war during World War One and uh quite clear about that and and later so i just yeah it's it's interesting that's a good question I, I should dig through the letters but i mean yeah what a fascinating thing i should look at july letters after or well really august letters because nobody knew until the bombing of hiroshima right yeah. yeah and and you know how could anybody have how could anybody have known yeah it was cutting cutting edge science First of all, like even to the point where the scientists didn't really know what was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it had to be. I don't know. I just uh, like how awe inspiring and shocking and just I can't even imagine it. Yeah. She didn't make any visual response to it. That's for certain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are making up for that. So. <laughs> All 
Um, let's move to wildfires. You have a lot of um, a lot of wildfire paintings. And so, yeah, you said that you you lived in L.A. for a while. And I was trying to remember if there were any going on at the time you lived there, if you'd actually seen stuff. Um, I I remember one day that I don't remember exactly when I was there, but um, the, the end of the moment and I was there from early 2003 to late 2007. So I was like four months shy of five years. And um, I remember walking out of my apartment. This is the first, it must've been the first year that I lived there. And there were fires just north, like in Santa Clarita area up, up north. And I walked outside and I looked around and was like, I was like, it looks like snow. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, this is ash. <laughs> So this is what I'm breathing. <laughs> it's not yeah. So it can be very uh, unnerving in terms of the kind of air quality that you're living in in LA and Southern California. Yeah, and a lot of other places these days too. Yes, everywhere pretty much in the United yeah. States. Um, and Canada. Um, yeah. So you know, Definitely. <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Um. You do a lot of of landscapes, and some of those are straightforward. And then there's also these that uh, that feature devastation. Um, and landscapes are something, and I know we've talked about this before too. Of just you know, it's um, people people poo poo those like they they're they're not necessarily um you know academic enough for mm -hmm. a lot of people in contemporary art these days but yet i you know i feel a landscape is never just a landscape there's always a whole lot more going on there um so can you talk a little bit about you know when you're working with landscape in terms of um, just conveying what you've seen in your travels or um, in other ways versus when you're working with them uh, depicting like fires and other kinds of devastation? I mean, I think if we think about we we can think about landscape as this thing we're looking at yeah i mean we can just like oh yeah i'm looking at this landscape and that's one thing but i mean if we we step back from it and we think about a landscape as a, this thing that's constantly changing and constantly being affected by the environment around it it's about space and time and and everything that's affecting what we're looking at and that that feeling we were talking about earlier that sublime nature is what is affected by space and time and like the fact that you know the the Rio Grande Gorge you know that has been formed over you know millions of years the Grand Canyon millions and millions of years and and these kind of places so I mean I think it's it's very simplistic to think that we're just painting a landscape but we're I think what I'm always charged by is some sort of um, energy of that place and and the kind of energy that that kind of comes back to me about that place and the excitement of being there and other things are what are coming through um, in a, a landscape like that. And then, I mean, just as I just said about, you know, uh, alluvial formations and water carving gorges and canyons and other things of that nature fire is such a huge part of that i was i was just in glacier uh national park and um the reason i was there is because i work with charlie russell's work now charles marion russell the western american painter and um uh he had a cabin in glacier from 1906 till his death in 1926 and he spent time there almost every summer over that 20 year span and um, fire was a huge portion of that but 
you know, that's that's great. We can talk about fire in relation to what was sculpting the landscape around Russell and has continued to sculpt it to this day. But th there would be no glacier without the glaciers and there'd be no Lake McDonald where he lived without a glacier that carved the bowl that is that lake. And so there's there's just all this stuff that's happening that I think we think is not that interesting or exciting, but it's kind of like volcanoes for you. I mean, volcanoes are, you know, belching up earth and creating islands and creating land masses. I mean, there's just constant, we may not think we're seeing it move in front of us, but it is happening. And we actually I talked a little bit about this. And when I um, talked with Renee Nunez, um, like some of the things you're saying are exactly like we didn't go into it in as much detail but yeah it's it's absolutely like it's like looking at, at a, a very tiny little slice of deep time and, yeah um you know like stars yeah right exactly um we're which, looking uh, at looking at the night sky yeah yeah that's look like looking backwards in time um and that hurt my head <laughs> It's so amazing. It's like, I mean, the moment I realized that there was this expanse of universe surrounding us and I just, I just became like, you know, like this, whatever, you know, like who cares about me? Yeah. But I, mean, I have the opposite reaction. I'm always just like, oh my God, like how magic is it that in all of this, I get to be me uh -huh. right now sitting here looking at like a uh, crater lake which is also yeah. a volcano um that at one time was a mountain and then there was a giant pyroclastic explosion and now like you know many 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 years later there's a beautiful lake there and it seems so still and peaceful but it's just like you know I could have been there during the eruption and it would not have been peaceful and beautiful. And like, this is the, this is the moment that I got to be here. Um, regardless right. of all of the crazy stuff going on in the world, you know, there's a preciousness to it. Uh, like make it like milk it, you know? Yeah. Not that I, I mean, me feeling small is just me feeling kind of, I don't know, I, I just feel insignificant in the face of the vastness that's out there that I think people don't really try to comprehend and, and get into. And I'm not saying, I I mean, I, I feel special. I mean, I'm, I know it's very special to get to experience these places and to be the places that I've been and be there at, at certain points in history and even if those are anniversary dates after things happened um but yeah i mean I, I just think it's it's just so much bigger than me and yeah. so i i just think that's so important to recognize and to to accept as part of our connection to these places at this point because and they're and I, we're losing we're losing them and we're destroying the biosphere and possibly ourselves and everything yeah. else along with it. You know, it's 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 an important topic, whether or not we're like reveling in the beauty of it or responding to these horrific events that are happening. I mean, horrific when you look at them in terms of the human loss of life and animal loss of life and those kinds of things um you know i understand like your point earlier that it's like these are natural processes um but also the the extremity like the hugeness of them and the frequency of them is directly our fault you know like it's yeah. humans created the conditions for that um, I was, we need to be paying attention to that i was in montana two weeks ago and i thought oh it'll be this great cool down it wasn't cool it was quite hot yeah uh, even at the highest elevations in glacier it was still quite hot and i was in san francisco and everybody from there that i talked to 
a couple of days ago were like so excited. It was so warm. And I was kind of like, this is not good, people. <laughs> There's nothing good about San Francisco being this warm in the summer. I mean, it's it, it just I thought I was getting a respite and not that it wasn't way cooler than here in Texas and Dallas. Um, but, it, you know, it was just like distressing that it was kind of like we don't we're not thinking about this at all, it, despite how bad it is right around us yeah not registering and i think that's that's what i'm saying is like i mean you may read a sign in the park that says this was formed 53 billion years ago but i don't think you know that's the kind of thing that it's really hard to register what that means yeah and and i don't think people stop to process what that means in terms of time and like just i mean again i go back to that I'm not trying to say this in a, a negative way, but the insignificance of us in our time and place and that we get to experience it, that's remarkable. But I mean, we, we, it's just insignificant in terms of time and space and place. Right. And I or think there's- that has barely existed and at some point will cease to exist, whether it's by our own doing or something else. But I mean, that's, that's nature. Yeah. I've been, I had this book um, that it's called Other Land. I'm looking at it right now. Other Lands. The author is Thomas Halliday. And um, I've actually been very, very, very slowly reading it like for over a year because I'll read one chapter and then I'm just like, I have to just sit with that chapter for a while. But it starts, um, it goes backwards in time. And it, it just chooses like one location on the planet. And it, he does a really good job of just like painting a picture of like, if you were there in that time, uh, what would you be seeing? What would be happening with the plants and the animals and how would the, the continents have shifted? And then it goes backwards another like million years and a million years, like, um, and it's just, I mean, even as someone who has had basically a lifelong interest in this kind of stuff, um, it, it's been really like eye-opening for me to, to like be able to imagine kind of like being in that setting and, um, and it really is like a, an appreciation on another whole nother level of like the fleeting nature of it all. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of being okay with that. Like it's, a, it's like, I don't, I don't want us to do things that bring it about, <laughs> but uh <laughs> But I also am like, well, that's the world is a essentially a living organism with all of these systems in place, and it's it's constantly evolving and changing, and that includes um, all of the the plant and animal life, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That this too one day shall pass. Right. Yeah, there was one chapter in there that has it really st stuck with me. That was about the formation of the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. um, because it really it actually happened really really quickly, and there was so there was like a little piece of land that separated it from the ocean. And essentially at one point it was just like this dam just like burst. And because it was, um, because it was like this big valley, there, there were like uh, micro uh, climates in there and species that only existed there, like in the same way that uh, like Great Basin or places like that have micro climates and, and very rare species that can only exist in that one place and um all of those were just like instantly wiped out by this enormous flood like biblical level flood um that just 
you know, happen incredibly quickly. Wow. Like, you know, like what you're saying, it's like, sometimes it happens really, really slowly, like the, the carving of the Grand Canyon. And then sometimes it's cataclysmic, you know. Maybe that's why the Straits of Gibraltar have that terms of the pillars of Hercules as if he's pulled them down and everything just like destroyed all at once. Probably, probably. Although, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to think about all that. And um, it's always fun talking about it with someone else who feels the same way and approaches it in a different way. And I don't have to feel like I'm trying to justify mm -hmm. or explain like even why I'm interested in, in a landscape. Um, yeah. It's so weird that landscape has such a bad rap. I don't, I don't know what that is exactly. It's such a carryover from like a, a, bygone era that's kind of like eh. i mean I, I mean if we're going to talk about you know all these abstract painters in the light in the 20th century that were also interested in landscape but pretended like they weren't um i know it's, just, it's really funny to me that that's still an issue for I people it's just a real like my my take on it is that it's a, a somewhat superficial reaction to something that just looks pretty Mm -hmm. Pretty has been a bad word in art for so long, like doing something for the sake of uh, being decorative or beautiful. And again, we could just like go right back to the beginning of this conversation and talk about patriarchy and how that's infiltrated the art world as well. And, and, and I, you know, I love academics, but there's a point where it, um, <laughs> it detaches from the felt experience of it. Yeah. Um, Many of my favorite painters, though, I think are, are very decorative painters. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I share your your love of, the, of American modernism and all of that group of painters and then kind of people who are working around that, but maybe not specifically in that group, but to me, that's, those are so much more about like what you're talking about, the energy of the place and the experience. Um, you know, they're not, they're not just like trying to naturalistically, realistically depict what's being seen. They're depicting like the, the felt energetic experience of, of being there. Yeah. And I mean, painters, beyond that time have done the same thing of just yeah. they very different ways and like prior to that even i would say that like the 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 nubby or the what we call post-impressionist or whatever i mean i think a lot of them did very similar kind of things so oh, like yeah. we are and bonard well, and those it's a guys. it's a progression i mean and we're all like it's a it's an essential part of being alive and being a human being i think that and that um you know like my the sheepdog part of my brain is gonna invent complicated compositions and stuff so that i can like satisfy that need to organize and be meticulous but i also have a very strong need to just be immediate and responsive um it's oh, it's like oh. the two the two things like the felt experience and the the intellectual or academic experience of something have have been separated and that's, i think that where like landscapes just get like written off and dismissed yeah I like your sheepdog comment because it's kind of like <laughs> we get you get kind of wrapped up in the way that you respond to things, and then I get I, I feel like in my art personally I get a little wrapped up too much in how things are portrayed, and then also there's that backwards nature of watercolor and my interest in white paper. You know, like how do you preserve white? 
and yeah. work. And so you you have to think very backwards in terms of how you're responding to your subject. You have to be and, strategic. Yeah, so, very, very. And, and, you know, it's like landscapes are, are dismissed and watercolor is also dismissed. And so, you know. I would argue a different thing though, that you there's this weird perception that nobody can do watercolor. And I'm like, yeah, but if you've been like, if you've dedicated 30 years to painting with this media, you know what you're doing. So like, it's nice that- What do you mean you nobody can do watermelon? Watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> nobody can do watermelon. Maybe I'm uh, hungry. Watercolor. I mean, I tell you that they just don't feel like they're competent with watercolor, like it's artists. Hard. It's hard. I think it's harder than, um, I mean, honestly, I haven't worked with oil since college, but I feel like it it is like uh, it's a it's a backwards way of thinking about it, um, and printmaking. Yeah, you have to think backwards, and that's yeah. why I call myself. Even though I haven't made a print in years now, um, but I did make a lot of prints in my past. But I, I always call myself watercolor and printmaker. But I think it's because the two go hand in hand in terms of how you have to think backwards to make what you're gonna make. Yeah. So maybe that just makes me a very backwards thinker. I don't know, but um, but I mean, a lot of people talk to me and they tell me how hard watercolor is, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, that's nice. But I've been if even if you'll dedicate yourself to a media for this long, you get used to it, and it's not there's no, I can't say there's anything yeah. hard about what's what. hard. What's hard about it, I think, is that flip you have to do in your head. Yeah. You no, know? and then uh the fact that it's unforgiving you know once it's on once it's on the paper you, there's only so much you can do if you make a mistake you know um it's not like you can just put another layer i mean you okay. can put another layer but you're gonna see through it you I mean, might it's all about layers i have like the those uh, black and red ones that I just did, you know, for the past several years, those are, they looked so deceptively simple. It's like a field of black and a field of red, but each of those areas has about 20 layers in it. Yeah. You know? um, the paper you work on. And I mean, there's, there's just different levels of what you can and can't manipulate and back out of. Um, because I did a series of paintings um, that I I call Gongshi. They're they're they I, I named they're actually bombs, but I named them after um, uh, Chinese scholar stones, yeah. and they look like Chinese scholar stones. They were super weird, and those were I, I decided I would go with this very bleedy technique in terms of the silhouette and what happened inside the silhouette. But I did them on cold press paper. Cold press is so unforgiving. You can't back out of that. You, you right. have, you screw it up, you screw it up, <laughs> you're going to walk away <laughs> and it sucks. Um, but like with anything that's got a good tooth to it, I feel like, you know, you got a lot of leeway in terms of you can, you know, you can wash the hell out of it. I learned from a good friend of mine a million years ago. Um, Heather Lenskis told me one day she was like, "I just took this watercolor and ran it under the sink," and I was like, "Yeah." Never thought about that. And it's such a great thing to do sometimes because you're like, "Well, when you and I went on our camping trip to Gorman Falls or to um, Colorado Bend, yes, thank you," yeah. um, and we painted Gorman Falls, like I just, you know, I kind of lose track when I'm doing that with other people because I get caught up in talking and whatever and I just totally overworked that painting that I was doing and I came home and just like grabbed a sponge and just like you know scrubbed it off wiped it down and was able to you know create kind of like a wash that I then used as a background and it's still not my favorite painting but it's it's fine it's not garbage painting anymore. So, 
Sometimes you can save things. I mean, there's a million things that I have around here that are just like sitting here derelict that will never be revisited. And I'm like, but I also like to keep. I like to keep the process visible. One of those Mars paintings. I don't know. You remember when you, I had the open studio at my old house in Austin, and you came down and you showed some of your work, and I had those Mars paintings. Um. And there was one of those, and I remember us talking about it at the time, like you, you noticed it, like you were the only person who noticed like what's going on right there. You know, there was like this real hard edge. It's in the next room, isn't it? <laughs> Not that painting, a different oh. one. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's one that um, was showing like some of the dunes and the, the blueberries which are like little tiny spherical um, hematite stones that have been found. Uh -huh. And um, I was working off of images that I had pulled from the NASA website. And I had those pinned up on my wall. And then like I had been painting, working on that painting late at night and went to bed. And when I closed the door, that uh, piece of paper with the the picture that I had printed out like fell off the wall onto the wet paper. And so when I went back in there the next day, it was dry and it had created like a the shape of the corner of mm. the paper. And I just left it. I just cool. worked like I just worked it into the painting, you know, like that's part of the process. Part of the accident of watercolor. Yeah. Um, if you understand watercolor, you got to let it do what it wants to do sometimes. Yeah. You just gotta go. It's like, I caught, like, to go back to the sheepdog reference, I like, I always think of it as like herding, H E R D, not H U R T, herding water, basically. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, what's the paper doing? How's it responding? Like, what, you know, um, it has a, a mind of its own. You want it to do its own thing or it's not worth having. Yeah, yeah. It's a balance. Of yeah, control. Own, yeah, and release of control mm -hmm. is what I love about it. Because that's, yeah. that's like the giant metaphor for life, right? Yes. <laughs> Finding that balance between control and release of control. Maybe that's the why I like watercolor. I never thought about that before. That's amazing. Maybe that's why I like watercolor because I I'm not good with just the letting it go and having its own way. And you life. are. You're brilliant at that with your painting, and so in life, you know. in life. <laughs> that's a totally different situation. And maybe that's why I like watercolor. So I'm like, I can let it do what it wants. Yeah, yeah. In life. I'm like, you know. <laughs> well, do you find that the I mean, I feel like I know the answer to this, but I'm, I'll let you speak to it. Like, do you find that the process of painting is a is like a calming meditative experience for you? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I like that question a lot. Um, yes and no. Um, I find sometimes when I'm working, I get incredibly tense and I, I can really just feel it all in here. My neck and my shoulders, and my arms. Uh, not that it's, I, I don't think it's the major cause of my tension, but there are days when I'm really into patterning, when I'm really into something that's very decorative and and very specifically supposed to be overly patterned, I can get a little cuckoo with the drawing and that definitely hurts yeah. more than anything. It, so it's funny, I mean, yes, I have to do this, I have to. I, I have to paint it. Yeah, so it's I like, understand that. I do. <laughs> it's like, no. and um, and it's it's something about getting something out of me. Uh -huh. But sometimes, sometimes it can be almost as stressful as daily life, which I hate to admit, but it's just true. I mean, I I I understand that. I appreciate that because there's definitely there are paintings that I've done where I don't know that other people can see it, but I can see where I fought myself you know yeah and and part of it was just that like striking that balance of the control and not control and it not responding in the way that i in my 
sheepdog, that part of my brain uh, wanted it to. Like it wasn't going where I wanted it to go. And I was annoyed and the whole painting is ruined and why am I even doing this? And like, you know, I better just start over, but I don't want to start over. You know, I know better. Like I know as soon as I get to the next layer that I'll probably be just fine with it, you know, and other people are going to see it differently. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. That's exactly my next question to you, which I know I'm not supposed to be asking you questions, but oh, I you can. It's, this is a the, conversation. Okay. <laughs> uh, like uh, is there ever a painting that you've made and you're kind of like eh, you know and then like you put it out there to people and they're like I love this and you're just kind of like oh, that's great <laughs> uh, I feel like sometimes not all the time and it goes the other way too that the ones that I'm like oh that's that's like some of my best work people are like eh. you know it goes both directions so funny yeah but I mean amazed at things that I make that I'm like I'm super happy with and usually they're res that well responded to not always but but like sometimes you make things and you're just like what the hell is this and why am I letting it go but people just like gravitate it's you never know what people are going to really respond to in terms of whatever is coming out of your crazy brain and your, your hands and, and so I'm almost there's stuff that I like I go in and out with where it's like at the time I was I was frustrated with it and then had periods of like really judging it and judging my own skills and approach and whatever and then other times where I look at it and I'm like oh no like no that's okay you know and then some time passes and I have a whole new response to it you know mm -hmm. it's um yeah it's 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 always an interesting multi-layered mirror of wherever we happen to be i think yeah um, totally. i'm back in my change of clothes magically so yeah we talked for a long time and um there's a whole bunch more that is all about UAPs, aka UFOs slash flying saucers, Tic Tacs, giant red floating squares, however you want to think about them these days, aliens, um, all the all the fun or not fun stuff, depending on your point of view. We. Uh, we sort of naturally slip into Mulder and Scully roles, which I find really interesting. And that's coming in a, a bonus video. So watch for that. But in the meantime, if you haven't watched the video with Renee Nunez, I want to invite you to do that because um, there's actually some really interesting uh, continuing themes that happened unintentionally between uh, the two videos and uh, I found it really fascinating how they kind of build on each other. So I'm going to put a little snippet right after I stop talking of uh, that conversation, but you can find the entire video um, in the link in the description below. So once again, thanks for watching and your support with uh, getting the word out there is, is greatly, greatly appreciated. So thanks a lot. Probably it's not a popular idea with people. <laughs> but I really think that people need to feel their place in the world. And I think that the place that we've sought isn't the, necessarily the place that's healthiest for mm -hmm. our psyches, for the environment, for anything. And I think what I'm hoping is to create that sense of like, actual place but it's you know i mean it's a metaphor it's not literal but i feel like it comes from feeling smaller from feeling humble and like you're not in charge of everything like yeah. you're just you're you're a component 